Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On the show today, we hear a seasonal words and their stories from Anna Mateo. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly tells us all about George W. Bush on our history program, America's Presidents. And the show closes with a special Learning English staff presentation of a famous and fun Christmas poem. But first, we hear from Jill Robbins. The U.S. Space Agency says an orange cat named Taters is the star of the first video sent by laser from deep space. NASA's Psyche spacecraft sent the 15-second video to Earth from 30 million kilometers in space. The video shows Taters as he chases a red laser light. It took less than two minutes for the video to reach Caltech's Palomar Observatory. The video quality is called ultra-high definition. It was sent at the test system's maximum rate of 267 megabits per second. NASA loaded the video into Psyche's laser communication experiment before launching the spacecraft to visit a rare metal asteroid in October. The mission team at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, in Pasadena, California, decided to use an employee's three-year-old cat. The video was sent to Earth on December 11th and was released by NASA this week. The test sent the video faster than most Internet connections here on Earth, said project leader Ryan Rogalin. NASA wants to improve communications from deep space as it prepares efforts to send astronauts to the moon and possibly to the planet Mars. The laser test is meant to send data at rates up to 100 times greater than the radio systems currently used by spacecraft far from Earth. More tests are planned as Psyche heads towards the main area of asteroids between the planets Mars and Jupiter. But Taters will not be making any more appearances, JPL said. Joby Harris is an art director at JPL's design lab. He could not be any happier, but he does not want his cat's new public attention to go to his head. I'm celebrating the spotlight with him, but making sure he keeps his paws on the carpet, Harris said in an email Tuesday. I'm Jill Robbins. And now... Words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Today, we talk about the word season. We use this word in many different ways. Season can refer to one of the four parts of the year. For example, Washington, D.C. is in a part of the United States that has four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Some parts of the U.S. do not have four seasons. Season can also describe the periods marked by warmth and growth, or cold weather and falling leaves. For example, when the weather becomes warmer and days are lighter longer, the growing season begins for some plants. When the weather gets colder and the days darker, the hibernation season begins for some animals. We also use season to describe periods that are only related to the weather. For example, 
Some areas of the world have rainy seasons and dry seasons. Some parts of the U.S. have tornado season, and in other parts of the world, there are monsoon seasons. Season can also refer to the time before and during a major holiday. December is a busy holiday season in many parts of the world. Holidays include Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and the Winter Solstice. December is often a time to take a break from work, and spend time with loved ones. Speaking of Christmas, when we say "tis the season," we are talking about something dealing with this holiday. Its good side, and its not so good side. For example, let's say I give a coworker a big box of homemade cookies. They might say to me, "Thanks, but why are you giving me so many cookies?" I can answer, "Tis the season." Here is another example. If I go out to a store and it is packed with holiday shoppers. I could complain to a friend, and they could respond, "Well, 'tis the season." What they really mean is this: at this time of the year, stores are usually very busy with Christmas shoppers. In fact, Christmas is like open season on shopping deals. Open season on something. Means that it is being hunted, targeted, or in this case, bought. Open season also describes a period of time when a particular activity or opportunity is unrestricted; it is widely available. This term probably comes from hunting. Hunting traditionally has many restrictions. People can hunt. Only at certain times of the year, and even then, there are restrictions on which animals and how many you can hunt. Fishing too has similar restrictions, but if it is open season, there are few restrictions. As in our earlier shopping example, we can use this term for just about anything. That is targeted with few restrictions. When talking about the best times to travel, for example, it is a good idea to travel off season. If few people are traveling, it is a good time to find cheap air travel, hotels, and rental cars. It is open season on travel deals, and like hunting season. We can have other seasons too. For example, beach areas are popular during tourist season, and people with allergies probably do not like hay fever season or allergy season. So, season can simply mean a time of the year marked by a special activity. Sports seasons, for example, are popular with fans of sports. We also have different seasons in our lives: our time as children, going off to college, becoming parents, helping our aging parents, starting new careers, or starting retirement. These are all different seasons of life, and they all have different aspects to enjoy and to be thankful for. And that's the end of this words and their stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English podcast. We just heard Ana Mateo discuss the many ways to use the word. Season. Anna joins us now. 
Hi, Anna. Happy holiday season to you. Hello, Dan. Thanks for having me. Season's greetings. Thanks, Anna. I really enjoyed your discussion about the phrase, tis the season. You mentioned you can say it in response to something good and something bad. So I have a trip coming up and I have a feeling I might be saying tis the season when I'm in a long airport line. Does that sound right to you? Dan, that is a great example. I think you will see lots of people waiting to check into their flights at the airport, getting their bags checked. Tis the season, Dan. You are going to be in the middle of holiday traffic. I'll just have to put a smile on my face and get on with my life. But maybe we'll get lucky and have a couple of empty flights. You never know. You never know, Dan. But as I just said, you are traveling during a busy holiday season. But on the other hand, if you wanted to go to a place that is popular in the summer this winter, you would be going during the off season. So it would not be crowded. Well, fingers crossed. We'll see what happens. Um, Let's think about another way to discuss the idea of a season. We all have seasons in our lives, don't we? Yes, we do, Dan. Anytime you start a new part of your life, you can consider that a change of season. Maybe you start college. Maybe you move from one city to another. Maybe you get married. That sounds about right, Anna. I just did two of those things in the last couple years, so I can mark my life by those different seasons. So the season for this episode is about to end. We should probably wrap it up, but we want to wish our listeners a happy holiday season, don't we, Anna? Yes, we do. Should we wrap it up together? Sure. You can count us in. How about on three? Okay, Dan, here goes. Happy holidays on three, two, one. Happy Happy holidays. holidays. We did it, Dan. That's a wrap. Thanks, Anna. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about George Walker Bush. He took office in 2001 as the 43rd president. He has a similar name to another president, his father, George Herbert Walker Bush. To simplify things, Americans sometimes call the younger Bush 43, or simply W. Here we will just call him Bush. Because Bush is a recent president, historians have not reached a broad agreement on his time as a leader. But he will surely be remembered for facing one of the biggest challenges to any president, the attacks against the U.S. on September 11, 2001. George Bush was born in the northeast state of Connecticut, but his parents soon moved to the southwest state of Texas. George grew up there and considered Texas home. The Bush family had a long background in politics. Bush's grandfather was a senator. His father held many public offices. In some ways, George was prepared for a career in politics, too. He went to the same private boarding school as his father. Then, like his father and grandfather, George went to Yale for college. He also worked on several political campaigns. But he said he did not consider pursuing politics. Instead, he earned a degree in business at Harvard and took a job in an oil company in Texas. In time, he founded his own oil business. And he married Laura Welch, who
who was a teacher and librarian in their hometown. They had twin daughters named Barbara and Jenna. In these years as a young adult, Bush began to make some changes. He began attending a Christian church regularly. He decided to stop drinking alcohol because it was creating problems in his personal life and he turned his attention to politics. Bush lost the first election in which he competed, a race to become a member of Congress. So, for a while, he focused on business investments and helping his father's political career. But in 1992, his father lost re-election to the presidency and the younger Bush saw a chance to enter politics himself again. In 1994, Bush ran for governor of Texas. To many people's surprise, he won. Four years later, he was overwhelmingly re-elected. Many voters liked his image as what he called a compassionate conservative. In other words, He wanted to use traditional Republican ideas about government to help society. Following two successful terms as governor, Bush turned his attention to the presidency. In 2000, he competed against the vice president at the time, Al Gore. The winner was not announced until more than a month following the election. Usually, the winner is announced within hours. Both sides disputed the process of counting votes in the state of Florida. Finally, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on the process. The court ordered state officials to stop recounting votes. Bush's lead stood. Bush entered office expecting to bring many of the ideas he pursued in Texas to the entire nation. For example, as president, he permitted religious groups to receive government funding and set national standards for public schools. These moves were popular with many voters, but they also challenged some American traditions. The separation of church and state and the ability of public schools to govern themselves. For many presidents, these policies might have created a legacy. But early in Bush's term, he faced a crisis that defined much of his time in office. Hijackers linked to the Al-Qaeda group seized four airplanes on September 11, 2001. They purposely crashed two planes into the twin towers of the World Trade Center in New York City, eventually killing more than 2,700 people. Another plane was flown into the Pentagon, the country's military headquarters outside of Washington, D.C. About 200 people died there. The fourth plane was aimed at another important target, But passengers fought the hijackers. The plane lost control and crashed in a field in Pennsylvania. All 44 people on board died there. President Bush was visiting an elementary school in Florida that morning. He learned about the attacks while he was reading with the children. At the end of the day, Bush spoke to the nation. He said, The U.S. would answer both the terrorist groups and the countries that permitted terrorist groups to thrive. Over the next years, Bush took a number of actions to create a new national security strategy. They included creating a Department of Homeland Security, making changes to the country's intelligence operations, and reforming the U.S. military. 
He also sent U.S. forces into Afghanistan to destroy terrorist networks there. Bush was especially targeting the person who had designed the September 11 terrorist attacks, Osama bin Laden. The struggle in Afghanistan was successful at first, but continued throughout Bush's time in office, and bin Laden was not captured while Bush was president. In 2003, Bush opened another front on what some called the War on Terror. He and other government officials said the leader of Iraq, Saddam Hussein, was developing weapons that could kill many people. They said Hussein and his connections to terrorist groups threatened Americans and people in other countries. Hussein did not agree to leave Iraq, so U.S. and British forces launched bombs at targets in the country's capital. Additional troops destroyed what was left of the targets. Hussein was quickly overthrown, but the weapons of mass destruction were not found. For the rest of Bush's presidency, U.S. forces remained in Iraq. Bush promised that Americans would stabilize the country and help Iraqis create a democratic government. The presidency of George W. Bush is too recent to understand its impact. But there is some evidence of the public's reaction at the time. Bush received some of the highest ratings of any president. In the weeks following the September 11 attacks, 90% approved of his leadership. He was re-elected in 2004 but his popularity steadily decreased. At the end of his second term, he had one of the lowest public approval ratings of any president, 33%. The U.S. economy had entered a recession. More Americans disagreed, especially with his decision to invade Iraq, and some criticized his government for responding too slowly after Hurricane Katrina struck New Orleans and the country's Gulf Coast. Since Bush left the White House in 2009, his approval ratings have, like those of many presidents, risen again. He has mostly avoided public appearances. Instead, he has enjoyed playing sports, helping charities, and reading U.S. history. He also began a new hobby, painting. He has created portraits of dozens of veterans to honor their service in the military. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. In 1822, an American professor named Clement Clark Moore wrote a poem that redefined the image of St. Nicholas. It was called Account of a Visit from St. Nicholas. He did not expect it to be published. He wrote it as a Christmas present for his young children. In recent years, Experts have questioned whether Moore actually wrote the poem. Some believe it was written by Henry Livingston, a map maker in New York, who wrote and published funny poems in his spare time. But whoever wrote this classic poem, it has since become a favorite around the world. This poem combines the traditions of Santa Claus seasonal decorations, and gift-giving 
that have come to define Christmas in America. We give you the staff of Learning English, reading Clement Clark Moore's poem, popularly known as "'Twas the Night Before Christmas." "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse." The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. (laughs) And Mama in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new fallen snow gave luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes did appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came. And he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop, the coursers, they flew with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes how they twinkled, his dimples how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke, it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word and went straight to his work, filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle. And away they all flew like the dow of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. That's all the time we have for today's show, but join us again tomorrow for another VOA Learning English program. Thanks for listening. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.